<coughs> I don't know why I'm making this noise. Even now, it's, it's, it's strange how, how uh, you... Oh, I think a good bookstore would go well here. Mm -hmm. I think if this guy gets it going... I hope so. And, um, yeah, people, I think, are, and I think he ought to combine it with, with uh, selling tapes. He probably will. Audio and videotapes. Uh, he it's probably nice will. Books now. Are people are using it. Oh, yeah. Actually, you can produce them cheaper than they can books. Yeah, I think they can from the advertisements that I get. Well, I had to quit buying books, uh, uh, oh, several years ago. Books are so expensive now. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to read that uh, silly book that Kitty Kelly wrote about uh, Nancy Reagan, yeah. you know. I've had my name on the waiting list up here at the library for weeks, <laughs> you know, just to get just to get one like that. And I try to get uh, when I hear of a new one, you know, I go up to the library and put my name on the list Good. because most any book now is sixteen ninety five, you know, and and, and, and hey, you know, nobody but uh, railroad workers, you know, they established the eight hour day, oh, years ago. But they were the only ones that had the eight-hour day. I worked 10 hours a day at Cherokee until the NRA. Then that's when we got the eight hours and $12.40 a week. What was it like to work prior to the NRA? Oh, it, 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 a 10 hours standing on your feet at a winding machine was very hard work. And I worked on the night shift. And that was very hard work. But uh, can you describe? <coughs> can you describe working in the winding room in the night shift for me? I've never been inside a cotton mill, so oh. not back then. Gee, uh, when I first started working at Cherokee, uh, on that night shift, I went to work at uh, uh, five o'clock in the afternoon, and on days like this, when you went in that mill at five o'clock in the afternoon, it was so hot you know, and all that uh, lint flying around, and it, it was so hot in there. See, you couldn't open a window. You couldn't have a fan because it would blow the lint into your machine. So you, we, we had nothing, and you'd think he was just going to suffocate in there. It was terrible. I'm sure, or I'm not certain either. I wonder if they have air conditioning in the mills now. Do they? They certainly should have because, see, we had nothing. We just had that heat, and it was hot. And then those machines running, you know, that added to the heat. Those little spinning machines and all. How many frames did you run prior to the eight-hour day? Uh, uh, my, I just had one machine. I ran thread. She was a winder. I was a winder. I ran thread from a cone onto a spool, and I had 12 spindles. And I stood there all night, you know. One would fill up and take it off and put another one on, you know monotonous and you get so sleepy. You get so sleepy doing that. But but it was, I think now sometimes if I just had that little machine and could just play with it, it would be kind of fascinating, you know. And, uh, and of course the machines were always breaking down. And I learned to fix my machine. I got so well acquainted with it, you know, that I learned to fix it. And I wanted a job. I was making eight dollars a week. And I wanted a job being a fixer because some of the fixers was making as much as $15 a week, you know. So I asked the uh, straw boss one day if I couldn't be a fixer that I knew how to fix my machine. And he said, are you crazy? Women can't be fixers. You know, no matter how much I knew about it, that was a man's job. There was no women fixers. Did you show him? That you yeah, I, sh I showed him. And he said, you must be crazy. He said, you can't be a fixer. That's a man's job. And I could fix it. I had uh, done it. Remember, I took a little old screwdriver from home with me. And I knew how to fix that machine. I'd watch them do it, and I knew how. He said, no. No, a woman can't be a... And there was for a long time that they didn't have women weavers. How did you respond to him? I probably told him he was crazy or something, <laughs> something like that. But at that time, we didn't have women's rights. We didn't have a feminist movement. You could whine, but you couldn't fix. And the, what about the noise in the machines? Mm. 
The noise was terrible. But you know, that was something you got used to. Uh, when I first started working there, I couldn't hear what the girl at the next machine, I couldn't hear a word she was saying, and I thought, oh, this, this will kill me. And in a little while, though, you get used to the noise. And we could talk across two or three machines, you know, just, just because we got used to it, that's all. What, I know this is going to sound funny. I've never asked anybody this, but standing there 11 hours or eight? Uh-oh, uh -oh. said workers uh, left here. You know, they, they had to leave. They they couldn't find jobs so here. So many of you locked out and, uh, and, and black blacklisted workers uh, left. left here. Yeah. Where did mm -hmm. they go? Uh, most of them went back to North Carolina. You know, in Gastonia, North Carolina, I don't know whether it's the same now or not, but there used to be 58 mills in Gastonia. You know, it was just all around there. And uh, the cotton mills then and these mills, they never checked any references. You know, if you went over there and told them I'm a winding machine operator, they hired you. And of course, at that time, you know, they didn't, they got your name and address, and that's all. See, there was no workers' benefits, no, no nothing, no holidays or anything. So all they needed was your name to put on your little paycheck. Do you know any of those that moved to North Carolina that have been active in your union? No, I, they left here, and that's been so many years ago. I've lost all contact with them. And if there are any in Knoxville now, I don't know where they are. When we go through these files and we go through the names, is there any chance if you look at names, you might be able to say, well, that one went to North Carolina? The reason I'm asking is because uh -huh. I'm going to be spending time in Gastonia and Belmont and Mount Holly, which is where those 58 mills were. So then I uh -huh. would have a name that I could... Uh -huh. I wish I could uh, think of one that uh, because they, they did leave here. But they wouldn't be working now because I was one of the younger ones at Cherokee, see? <laughs> they were all older people. Why was They're that? Prob probably all uh, dead. Well, well, I'm 80 now. And... Uh, <laughs> Lucille, I hope I, I have the same glory you have when I'm 80 years old. That's uh, 80 is, uh, that's my public name. I'll be 83 in September. Are you just going to stay 80? I'm going to stay 80. You know, like people used to stay 29. I'm going to stay 80. But I'll be 83 in September. 83. What's the secret, lady? Uh, getting shingles, I guess. <laughs> like Mrs. Roosevelt. Yeah. Getting shingles. How did that help you stay old? Oh, I just so said that for a joke. Oh, that, that, is a, that is a joke. But that is the only ailment that I've had. I got shingles, but that's bad enough. That's bad enough. It sure is. Yeah. I got that, um, still have it, <clears throat> but I got that two years ago, and I was wanting to go to Miami to a convention, so <laughs> I wanted to get well, and I should have listened to the first doctor I went to. Uh, he said, you've got shingles, and there's not a thing in the world you can do about it, and I should have stopped right there, but I wanted more. I was in, in such pain. And I wanted to get well to go to the Miami Convention, so I went to another doctor. Was that the Act 2 Convention in Miami? No, no, it's Senior Citizens okay. Convention. That's the ones I go to now. I'm with the National Council of Senior Citizens. Are you acquainted with, that, with them? I'm are you? Member. Oh, are you? Good, good. Welcome. <clears throat> Glad to have you. <laughs> but I wanted to go to that convention, so I went to another doctor, and uh, <clears throat> he sent me to another doctor. And they examined me all over. I don't, there's nothing. They, you know, all them EKGs and all that, uh, whatever they have, and this, that, and the other. And they didn't come up with a thing in the world but shingles. God only knows how much that cost my insurance and Medicare. And I should have listened to the first doctor. You got shingles, and there's nothing we can do about it. That sounds like my father saying. Get anywhere with mine. <laughs> I don't get a bit of sympathy. You know, if you haven't got anything but shingles. You can't, and, you're not wearing a pacemaker. And yeah. <laughs> I know it. And, you know, I, I'm glad that I don't. Uh, they have this saying going now, which certainly is the truth. You can't afford to be sick. Yeah. Now, I have a friend that lives in one of the high-rise apartments here. She showed me a little bottle of medicine that she paid $89 for. Did you know prescriptions go that high? Well, you know what we should do? The young people who aren't going to be able to ever afford insurance, 
in the future, if it goes on like this, and the old people, the older people, uh -huh. <laughs> who really know where it's at and are living with these problems right now and living so frightened that if something, God forbid, happens to them, that they're in trouble and they lose it all, right? We should get together and form like, like this polar organization and go up and storm. We should have Capitol a national health care plan. And demand no national health. There's no, no question about it at all. And I read just the other day where the AMA has admitted that we need a national health care plan. But I wouldn't trust them. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want their plan. Because I can remember when they were fighting health insurance. Oh, I can too. I sure do. Oh, absolutely. Social Security, you know. And, uh, was. and I think we're going to get, uh, I, go to the, I go to Washington three times a year for the National Council. And we talk about that all the time. And I think as many people as are talking about it now, that we're going to get, I don't know when, maybe three or four years from now, but I think we'll get a national health care plan. I think so. We're the United States and South Africa, only industrialized. I was at the Act 2 convention last year. <laughs> talking about picket lines, Lucille. <laughs> well, what, uh, we, what, what, what okay. were we talking about now, last? Uh, when we, we've read something about what, Um, I think I was, at the time I was working at, uh, I don't know where I get my good health now. At the time I was working at Cherokee there, I wasn't in very good health. Of course, I was just very young then, in my teens. And I was so mad at those long hours and that little pay that I think I would have been sold on anything there. Uh, where they accused me of being a communist, I think if a communist had come along and said, well, look, we can get you better hours, wages, and working conditions, that's all we were working for. You know, we didn't know anything about any holidays or health insurance or any of the benefits that would go with it. And I think that was it. I was just plain mad. Did, but did you have, your father was a, was a farmer and a, a, a grocerman. small grocerman. Right. Did you, was any tradition of no. uh, political activism in, the, in your background? Oh, uh, the, uh, my father was a real politician. He was a justice of peace up in Sevier County for 35 years. Married more couples than anybody because he would do it free. <laughs> <laughs> he, he was a politician. But, uh, well, see, uh, nobody around here uh, particularly, I'm sure they did in other cities, but there were no unions here. We didn't know anything about unionism. Uh, and the only people that were organized here were the railroad workers, and not very much was ever said about that. Of course, they had a strike in 1921, but and, uh, there wasn't much said about it. And the carpenters claim that they have always had a union here, and the typographical union. But other than that, there weren't any unions until we got the NRA which said workers shall have the right to organize without coercion or intimidation. But it seems to me so strange that a young woman like this should latch on to, to a political idea. Usually her father or her uncle or <laughs> right, some, or no. somebody has an uncle. No, no, there was none, none. My father and, of course, my mother, just a country girl, third grade education. And no, they didn't know anything about uh, even community organization or anything like that. Did you, you did read books or publications or anything? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. I did. I was a, as soon as we moved to Knoxville, I found out where the library was. What did you read? And whatever I could find. And after this organizer came here, I tried to find, I could find very little material in the libraries concerning the labor movement. Very little. And uh, they said at that time, of course I wasn't in school, I had to drop out of school, that the school books were slanted. You know, there was nothing in the school books at all about uh, uh, unionism. And, and the only union, the only time uh, that I, I guess the first inkling I ever got 
of anybody doing anything was long before the strike because I was working at the Appalachian Mill there. And we went to work one morning and um, in great big yellow letters was written across the street down there, Free Sacco and Vanzetti. And I wondered who in the hell is <laughs> Sacco and Vanzetti? And what is that all about? I couldn't find anybody that knew. Nobody seemed to know uh, who they, who it, who it was, or why it was there, or anything. We all went around and looked at it, you know. And they called Vanzetti all kinds of things. But how do you spell that? And what, what is his name? And wonder who he is. And you know, it was some time later that I found out who Sacco and Vanzetti were. And then, uh, uh, then. Uh, we don't know. It was on a banner? No, it was on the street. Oh, yes. written, written right across the street. Of course, there wasn't much traffic in graffiti. front of the mail at night. And it was graffiti, but it was on the street in big yellow letters. Free Sacco and Vanzetti. And we never did find out who did it. And everybody was asking in the mail, uh, you know, like they'd ask me, did you ever know those guys? And I said, no, I don't know them. Did you? And no, I don't know anybody named Vanzetti. And they said they looked in the telephone directory and there wasn't anybody in there by that night. <laughs> and nobody knew who they were, you know. And I found out then, I think I got a book from the libraries. I don't know where I got it, but I found out uh, who they were. And then uh, it wasn't uh, much later than that that they were talking about Free and Tom Mooney. You Tom remember? Mooney. Yeah, <laughs> remember that one. Yeah, Tom Mooney was in the Atlanta jail at that time, yeah. Yeah, uh-huh. Who was and Tom Mooney? What, wait a minute, what did Tom do? Wasn't he uh, supposed to have blown up a... Uh, he was a socialist. He was a socialist. Who was supposed, who was accused of, uh, of uh, being part of the, of the violence of the San Francisco strike. That's right, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And he was supposed to have been in some... No, it was Sacco and Vanzetti that... No, the uh, Sacco and Vanzetti, Vanzetti were in... in New in, Jersey. In, in, in uh, Boston. Bo Boston, that's, that's right. right. Yeah. No, but uh, Tom Mooney was in San Francisco. That's right. Uh, yeah. that was, he was accused of uh, the, uh, some violence there, and uh, that the way it's, there were some deaths, and he was put up in federal prison. There. That's right. It was some oh, kind of an explosion or yeah, something yeah. like that, sedition, that, yeah. that he was. Yeah. But... Uh, we had, we had a lot of fun over that Sacco and Vanzetti. Nobody knew who they were or what they were. Or never did find out who did it. So how, yeah. did, how did finding out about them, how does that relate to you? Well, I thought there must be a group somewhere, you know, when I really found out what they were doing, that there must be people somewhere that were fighting back. Mm -hmm. See, nobody around here, I'd never thought about, you didn't think about fighting uh, cotton mill bosses. You know, nobody had ever heard of that. You, you said, uh, yes, sir. And that was all. You didn't. Now, may I just ask you a very pointed question, Lamb? When we started this, and I remember I grew up in Winston Salem. I grew up in a factory town. I knew all that kind of thing. But I would thought I would have anticipated that there would be a lot of resentment on the part of cotton mill workers towards their employers who had all those big houses and making all that money on their backs. There was. There was. Now, could you tell me about that? Well, there was. Uh, they, there wasn't a, uh, a whole lot said about it, but it, it, was, it was there because our, uh, oh, what was his name, our Cherokee, I'm, I'm losing, losing my thought, uh, Heinsen. Uh -huh. The Heinsen was there, you know. And they'd say things like in there, well, but your old Heinsen wouldn't stand in here on his feet all day like we do, you know, and things like that. And, they, they, yeah. Did, they did say that. Okay. They did say that. Yeah. And, uh, well, what happened when Hansen would walk they, by? They'd uh, uh -huh. made anonymous telephone calls to his home. I know they did that because mm -hmm. I did it. And, uh, you know, all kinds of things like that. What, what did about they, what that? What did you say when he picked up? That, and uh, we do, they do uh, uh, little things like, I remember one time there was a, a picture came out in the paper here, a very vivid picture of a baby that had starved to death. And uh, they sent that picture to Heinz and, you know, and said, 
why did why didn't you you got plenty of money why didn't you buy the baby something to eat? <laughs> you know and things like that yeah there there was that definitely that resentment that's interesting and and see the people now west knoxville has always been our uh, uh, elite neighborhood. That's where Cherokee Boulevard is, and that's where the uh, elite uh, live. And uh, they, people, the workers there at Cherokee would say to each other, oh, stop acting like you lived in West Knoxville, you know. And there was definitely a line drawn. Those people did not associate with the cotton mill workers. Now, we were ostracized that far uh, that we weren't. And I heard that the churches uh, were discriminating, too. I didn't go to church enough that time to know much about it. But, uh, of course, all the preachers, the little hack preachers around here, they were all against the union, you know. They fought us. That was one of the worst things we had to fight during the strike. Could you tell us a little more? It was, about, that? was uh, about the preachers. We'd talk, un we met on Saturday. Of course, we had to. He was working all week. We'd meet on Saturday, and we would talk to union, talk unionism to them, and tell them why they should join, you know, and why why we were why we were a union, and tell them all the benefits that they would receive through belonging to the union. The doggone preachers would tear it down on Sunday, and we had that all the time. And I always thought that that was a a very a bad thing that they would do because this is the Bible Belt through here, you know. And those people uh, were not taking any chance on going to hell for joining a union. And the preachers would go that far with it. And a church in this neighborhood, right down here on Gillespie Avenue, a little Baptist church down here, one Saturday they had a sign, as, oh, it is half as big as that wall over there, said C-I-O. Christ is out. Now we had we we had that. Uh, but and so these, that was a little later. But the, you yeah. had that same. Oh, we had earlier. that absolutely, absolutely, and it didn't go away for a long, long time. I don't know whether the preachers in these churches are still doing that Do you now. You know where it came from. Uh, I think, I uh, we we always thought. And somehow we had some proof of it. I've forgotten exactly where we got it. These mill owners were paying the preachers to to do that because all of the the preachers were against it. Now we know With one exception, yeah. and I think that is interesting. Uh, the marble workers here, and you know that's real hard work. That's even harder than working in a mill. And the marble workers had all these itinerant preachers, you know, preaching up on Market Square and all that stuff. They were not against us. They were, because <laughs> they were our members, but they were still preachers. And I know I told Miles a story about them one time. They, uh, I thought some things about them were good. For one thing, you got those preachers, they wanted to express themselves and they were, would get them a little congregation, so they made good talkers in the union, and I liked them for that. And I was listening one day to a meeting that they had over at the Labor Temple, and uh, they would, no matter how much they would fight in their meeting, they called each other brother all the time, and when they adjourned, they all joined hands and sang, Blessed be the tie that binds. <laughs> no matter, so I asked one of them one day, I said, uh, and they'd refer to each other, it's preacher so-and-so, it's preacher so-and-so. And I asked him one day, I said, are all these guys in here preachers? And this uh, one said, no, I'll tell you what. He said, some of us is preachers and some of us is false prophets. <laughs> <laughs> but they weren't against us. They, they, they had them a congregation in their local union. And so they were with us. But the other churches, the organized churches, these were just itinerant preachers meeting around in uh, different stores. Peter, that we had at Cherokee was Preacher Camel. Hmm. He, he, we had a lot of preachers in our midst there too. And I didn't realize at the time, I thought, well, these preachers are good, but I didn't realize at the time what was motivating them. They wanted an audience. Yeah. 
and they could get it in their local union and they had somebody to talk to and they were good in negotiating contracts and all because they they wanted to talk yeah. and the union was a good vehicle yeah, for them uh, to express themselves well now when you got on the picket line what did you do oh we picketed we walked up and down in front of the mill and uh, uh picketed did you sing yeah we sang um miles horton came to town and miles taught us some union songs that solidarity forever, and I've uh, forgotten what another one what, was. What year was this that Miles came to town? 1934. Yeah. Uh -huh. Miles started Highlander in 1932, I believe. Yeah. And uh, Miles came here, and he taught us uh, those songs. Yeah, we'd sing on the picket line. What, do you remember any other songs? We had that one. Oh, um, and uh, uh, one that, um, did you ever know Claire Killen at TVA? He was an old wobbly, and he was the, you know what the wobblies were? Yeah, sure. uh -huh. um, he was the first director of labor relations at TVA, and he helped us and guided us a lot. And he gave us that song, uh, but our people wouldn't use that one. They said it was blasphemous or something like that. That one about you'll eat pie in the sky oh, when yes. you die. How does yeah. that sound? Uh, let's see. Long-haired preachers come out Long every preachers come out every night. Try to tell you what's wrong and what's right. What comes but next? When asked if them when to eat, eat, they, they will tell, tell you in the, the tone so sweet, sweet something, something so sweet. sweet. You, you work and pray, work and pray. You get pie in, in the, the sky, sky. in the glorious red above the sky. Work and pray, eat on hay, you'll get pie in the sky when you die. <laughs> and our people wouldn't use that one. They didn't use that, and they thought that was uh, uh, blasphemous because it come from sweet by and by, you know. But they liked solidarity, and we sang that one. And then we had an, another one that some guy in Tennessee, I don't know whether that's in any of my old scrapbooks or not, some guy in Tennessee made that one. Um, what was that one? It, it, was, it, it was real good. Roosevelt says stand up. Let's see, Roosevelt. Oh, yes, it's in your... Uh, is it? Roosevelt said stand you've up. You've got the words, but not... You, you got... I'll let me get the words. Maybe you'll sing. Oh, Lord. Oh, I can't sing. For goodness sakes, no. Roosevelt says, stand That's up, true. boys, and mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. sure. you've been in prison for many long years. Oh, oh, I know that tune. Da, 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 yeah. Da, da, well, da, I, I, Top I, of Old Smokey? Was it the tune? Uh, well, I don't know what it was to tune, because I can't sing. But uh, that, that was a... a Roosevelt says, stand up, boys, and dry up your tears. You've been in distress for many long years. And what's the rest of it? I've got this here. Roosevelt says, stand up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's not old Smokey. <laughs> but we used that one. But uh, I understood that uh, uh, some guy in Tennessee, down in one of the mill places, uh, wrote that song. You didn't have Zelfia yet. Zelfie, Zelfie, she came in a little, a little bit later, I think. Uh, I don't know whether Miles and Zelfia were even married. No, that's, uh, that's uh, I think uh, they got married in '34. Yeah, I think they did too. She came from Arkansas. Yeah, that's it. Chisler Sar, Roosevelt said, "Stand up, boys, and dry your tears. You've been in distress now for four long years." J. H. Phillips, Harriman, Tennessee, wrote that. Yeah, that's good. Go? I don't. I don't know. I really don't remember the the tunes that. Try. They counted on Franklin to give us a break. Our jobs and our money was all at a stake. Well, I hate to. No, I can't. I can't sing, but that that's a good song. Now there's some uh, issue. Oh, I know that came out of the uh, Har Harriman hosiery strike. Now, there's an issue that uh, we that we need to get addressed. We know that in 
32 with the uh, 33 when the code came in, uh, things changed radically. Uh, absolutely. You, you went from 11 hours to 10 hours to, to 8 hours. Right. Your wages were nearly double. We went from uh, we went from eight dollars a week to twelve forty a week. How'd it feel? Oh, it felt great. Uh, but you know, there was an objection to that uh, around here among a, a lot of the mill owners and uh, the big businessmen. With all that spare time on our hands, we's going to get in trouble. <laughs> you know, what were we going to do? Oh, we even had a, a, a newspaper reporter. That's probably somewhere in those old scrapbooks. Uh, a newspaper reporter. Uh, came out to some of our homes, and mine was one of them, uh, to ask us what we were going to do with that spare time. You know, what in the world would, would, would you do? You start to work at 6 o'clock in the morning, and you get off at 2. You got that whole afternoon, you get into mischief. You know, it's bad. <laughs> yeah, oh, that was, that was a, a, a big deal. A lot of people wondered about it. And uh, uh, some of them, too, thought about it. I certainly didn't, but some of them thought about it. Well, working like this, you can you can get other jobs too. You know, do some moonlighting, mm -hmm. get another job, just well, now, working eight I, hours. I know that very soon then they started instituting the stretch out. Oh yeah. To make oh. up for that. Oh yes. Uh -huh. And uh, then the workers started protesting, and there were all of these letters and protests to the Washington. We got all that. And finally, and the boards never did anything. So finally, just we got fed up and struck. Uh huh. But, and this is indicated by the nature of this. You see that second thing there? Oh, yeah. We, did that uh -huh. we have suffered the stretch out until we can endure no more. But the, also about the boards. We tried to negotiate, but employers will not negotiate. Finally, our great national convention voted to strike. The hour is at hand. Be ready. Organize for action. Oh, that's that uh, stretch out system. That was one of the worst things uh, that could have possibly happened. Could that, you describe that? That uh, stretch out system. Uh, well, uh, for instance, it wasn't quite as bad. At, at Cherokee as it was at some of the other places here uh, for this reason. We were already doing all we could. But the Appalachian mill here, uh, which made men's knit underwear, uh, what did they call it? No, it wasn't standard. Standard mill was health knit. But they made uh, men's long underwear, union suits we called them. And uh, uh, they doubled up on them, that they had to sew more. But at the machine that I was working at there, no person could have possibly done more. Mm -hmm. uh, but all these companies around here, in fact, the Appalachia uh, imported a man, some people said he was from France, I don't know where he was from, uh, to show them how. Uh, the Bedo uh, system. The Bedo system. Uh, yeah, I was trying to yeah. think of the Bedo yeah. system yeah, right. to sh show them how yeah. to do right. stretch We've out. We've done a lot of stuff on the Bedo system. Uh -huh. And the marble workers said that they used that stretch yeah. out on yeah. them. Too. Now, the worst thing about the veto system was not only that it stretched you out and puts you on quota for everything, but if you went over quota, you got paid three-fourths of the value of that. The other fourth went to your foreman. Oh, it was that bad. So, you see, the foreman's going to lash you. you. Oh, absolutely. Excuse me. So you see how, when we go to this women, whom we got pictures of getting rounded up uh -huh. by the troops, they won't talk about it. They won't talk about it. I know it. I know it. And that, as I said, I'm not surprised. You are I, not surprised. No. I'm just, are you ready? I didn't know you were ready. Yeah. Are you? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. We're going to talk about this um, <clears throat> from this uh, flyer. Yeah. To all textile workers official notice where it says no more boards and no more juggling around no more tricks and no more waiting while government boards give us the runaround actually what was so bad there was the waiting 
while you were waiting for a, a board to decide something, you might be unemployed or blacklisted while you were waiting for them. And our people wondered all the time, well, what are they doing in Washington? What, what, what have they got so many cases? If they do have, they ought to hire more people, you know, and waiting for the boards. And a lot of people lost confidence in them, which, which wasn't good because the boards were good. They just weren't doing their jobs. And I don't know why. I don't know why, why they didn't. Maybe it was something that uh, maybe even the board members were so unaccustomed to doing that they didn't do it. But that waiting there was, uh, as it says in this, giving us the runaround. Well, the runaround wasn't as bad as the waiting to get something done. Now, how did you feel as a <coughs> young labor organizer, unofficial, I mean, not coming up against the lawyers for the company in preparing that thing you sent to Washington, for example. How did I feel about yes. uh, <clears throat> about doing that? Yes, I mean, here they've got all those secretaries and the lawyers and so forth, and you've just got your own self and your own handwriting. I know it, I know it. I had, uh, by the time I was writing those things, I had, I, I was realizing more and more what the labor movement meant. And I thought, this is no time to back down. I'm already a blacklisted textile worker, and that's what I'm going to be, so just go ahead with it. So I did. I, 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 I didn't care. Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd gone that far with it, and I didn't what, care. What but, gave you that guts? I don't know. Where do, you, <laughs> where, where do guts come from? <laughs> I don't know. I must have had them. But I, I think I was mad. I was mad all the time uh, from that hard work and low pay, and I was just mad about it, and I didn't care. I didn't care. Uh, as I said, I was already blacklisted. I was accused all the time of being communist. The churches were against me, and I didn't care. How did your family feel? Uh, they didn't know. My parents didn't. Of course, one of my sisters was an organizer. Uh, my parents didn't know enough about it, uh, but they urged me when I would tell them what I was fighting for to go ahead, to go ahead. They, they supported it. However, they didn't know exactly what they were supporting, but they did support it. Because <laughs> it made my father extremely mad when it came out in the paper that I was a communist. And uh, he was the one who first said that uh, word to me. Those bastards don't know the difference between communism and rheumatism. Well, he probably didn't either, so. <laughs> but he, he was supportive of it. Now, okay. Yes? Okay. Uh, in the middle of this strike, the head of the Central Trades and Labor Council, with whom you've been working, right, came out with an attack on saying that communists and so forth and so on. Could you talk about that? That's right. That's right. Uh, that was Stanley Rounds. He was an iron worker, and he was one who really didn't know the difference between communism and rheumatism. And he thought that it would make him popular, and he wanted to get his name in the paper, you know, that he's a big labor leader, and he can join in with these other people who are making all those accusations, you know. It made him look good. That's very mm -hmm. important for us to get out. Okay. Okay. Go, go. Yeah, I, I want to ask you a simple question, and then it's going back, but I think it'll be a good place for us to lead off on how you did some of your organizing, which is before you said talk union. You were talking about your meetings and talking union to the people. And um, I, I want, could you, could you tell me some of what you told them? I mean, what is unionism to you? What we uh, uh, told them, see, we, including me, we, we, did, we were certainly not knowledgeable about the labor movement. And we could talk to them in terms of the same thing that you can talk to people today about, something that affects them directly. And when we would tell them that the union would get them uh, 
better wages, shorter hours, and better working conditions. Because that's all we were working for. <clears throat> we weren't working for any of the things that they have in the, <coughs> excuse me, uh, that they have today, like health insurance, paid holidays. We didn't have any of that. All we wanted was, and we could tell them, and when you point out to people that something you're doing is going to help them individually, uh, they, 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 they would accept it. And then the darn preachers tear it down on, you know. Now, we were just in Gadsden, where we had some outlines of what happened at Dwight, you know, that big factory down there. Mm -hmm. One of the accusations was that a guy who was a supervisor in the spinning room took advantage of the girls and said if they didn't go out with him and so forth, that they get fired. And they'd even some one of the girls even took him to court one time, and he got off. Mm -hmm. uh, that was in the deposition. So we started asking people who were there, and they all remembered this guy and said he was guilty. Well, did that happen in your mill? No, I don't remember. Now I heard that it was happening in other mills here, but, but I don't remember an incident. I don't remember a, an incident in it's ours. It, yeah, it sure was. It seemed to be in just certain mills, and uh -huh. it wasn't just general. Yeah. No, it, it, I don't remember that happening yeah. in ours. Mm -hmm. But uh, And you had those people uh, that sort of revered the, the bosses. You know, uh, we'd like to be like them. Mm -hmm. You know, we want to, we'd like to make the money that they do, mm -hmm. and they have better homes than we do, they have better conditions than we do. We, we had a, a very interesting interview in Cabbage Town. We talked to two sisters there, but all this time later, to get them with Mr. Zorn. That's right. Oh, there was, there was that reverence. Yeah. Absolutely. And that was a thing that we, that we had to work. Um, what was needed at that time, see, this is hindsight. What was needed so much was labor education, and we did not have it. And I don't think the labor movement today is doing enough of that. And they certainly didn't do it then. Now, you can imagine us there at the Cherokee, none of us, including me, we didn't know anything about the labor movement. And the national office called us out on strike. And we, we didn't know. We hadn't had time to educate the people. And they, they didn't know. They, they all wanted to be like the boss. You know, so. Did you ever know Gorman? Yeah, Francis Gorman. Yeah, mm -hmm. tell us about him. Um, I think, well, I don't know. Gorman was a little bit in the same class as us. I don't think he knew as much about the labor movement as he should have. He, he certainly was not a good top leader. He might have been conscientious enough and tried, but I never thought that he was, he was certainly not any top uh, uh, leader there. You know, Miles had a lot to do with labor education around here. He, he did an awful lot on that because nobody else was doing it. And all any organizer, uh, when they would come in, they never talked anything about the history of the labor movement or even why we were organizing. You know, just, uh, well, we can get you better hours, wages, and working conditions. And that's, that's all they talked about. Let's go back to Gorman. Why did you meet him? I met him, and uh, he came here. Uh, I went, as soon as I joined the... As soon as I became a member of the Textile Workers Union, I was also a delegate to the Central Labor Council here. Uh, there was three women in the council then. That was no place for women, so a lot of the men said. And uh, I went to, uh, I was elected as a delegate uh, to go to a state labor convention in Memphis, and that's where I met Gorman. And I wasn't in uh, he's a nice enough guy, but uh, he was certainly no intellectual. Now, he was from England. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did he speak with an accent? Uh, slightly. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did. Because we've come across a letter to Roosevelt 
from one of the manufacturers saying, what right has this foreigner who is not a citizen, or we don't have proof that he's a citizen, what right is he? Is he to come over here and tell <laughs> That's us? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if he yeah. seemed like a foreigner. Well, he he had that slight British accent, all right. But uh, did you ever hear him a, on the radio? No, I didn't. And maybe it was because I didn't have a radio. He used the radio. Did you ever hear Roosevelt on the radio? Oh yes. Oh tell yes. Us about yes. That. Yes. His uh, uh, fireside chats. Mm -hmm. Oh yes. Everybody would listen to Roosevelt. You know, and people around through this. You know, this, this part of East Tennessee, I mean, this part of Tennessee is Republican. Mm -hmm. Our congressman, you know, is a Republican yeah. here. Uh, but Roosevelt changed a lot of minds there. And we used to listen to his fireside chats, you know. How did you listen if you didn't have a radio? Uh, uh, some neighbor would have one. Somebody would have a radio. And when Roosevelt was coming on, we'd go to their house to listen to the radio. Did did the workers talk about his speech the next day in the Continental? Uh, yeah, they'd uh, sometimes they'd get it um, pretty much misinterpreted, but they did talk about it. That and they certainly felt that Roosevelt was their friend. Okay, now speaking of misinterpretation, all the way through these letters, thousands of letters written to Roosevelt, they are assuming that Roosevelt said that they should join a union. That is right. That is now, right. Now, Roosevelt never said that. No, he didn't. But we said that he said it. <laughs> Why? Uh, because in that, um, uh, in the NRA, in the NRA, in that, it said, workers shall have the right to organize without coercion or intimidation. And we took it from that that Roosevelt meant for us to organize. We, we interpreted it the way we wanted to, you know. Okay. And that's that, the way I we think did. That's a very yeah. important, but I uh -huh. think that's the nice way to put it. Okay. We, yeah, we yeah. made our own interpretation of it. Now, and this is my interpretation. When the strike was called off, Gorman called it off. Mm -hmm. He's calling it a great victory because yeah. you got one more guy on the board. <laughs> it was no victory. But and Roosevelt influenced him to call it off. Now, it was been assumed that Roosevelt thought he had some kind of agreement with the textile barons, whom he'd gotten to know in Warm Springs and all of that, you know, the Callaways mm -hmm. and the colors, mm -hmm. that they would not discriminate. And of course, immediately they started discriminating discrimination. Absolutely. What was your understanding at the time? Okay. Uh, we were so enraptured uh, with Roosevelt that we didn't really believe, you know, we didn't, we didn't believe that he would. Uh, see, Roosevelt uh, uh, we, we just thought he was the greatest guy because he'd given us the right uh, uh, to organize. And nobody would believe that Roosevelt could do anything wrong. I think he, he was too, though. I think he was too. I think he was. You did. Yeah. Okay. I well, thought he was. We really want to say that, yes, you say that directly. Okay. What did you think, think at the time? I thought at the time that he was hoodwinked uh, because we, and it was a disappointment to feel that way about him, because we had put so much faith in him, you know, and we still uh, didn't believe that he was guilty, you know, that somebody had uh, given him the wrong information. <laughs> That's what, we didn't think Roosevelt was, you know, he wouldn't do anything like that. You think about Joe Jacobs? Yeah, oh yeah, I met him. Well, he, he was one of the people who recorded. Oh, is that right? And he says that as a result of this, that Roosevelt backed the Wagner Act. It's an interesting idea. Uh -huh. yeah. He would not, wouldn't have backed the Wagner Act except for. Now, we do know that if Wagner hadn't, the Wagner Act hadn't been passed in 1935, it would never have been passed. Wait, it was in the Wagner Act 
right. where we had that uh, statement right. that you could organize that's instead right. of yeah instead right. of that's, uh -huh. that's, right. that's right that's right that's right that was in the Wagner Act now that you brought it up I remember yeah, it was in the Wagner Act, Act. Yeah. Uh -huh. but he says that that's why the Wagner Act happened uh -huh. we all know who really looked at it that we thank God for 1935 we, if we hadn't been for 1935 in the Wagner Act because by 1936 even though Roosevelt got a way of a, a, a of the plurality, all of these damn southern sons as congressmen go poured in there, and all of these conservative Democrats right. riding on these coattails. It wouldn't have been passed later. No, it wouldn't. Yeah. No, it wouldn't. They were thinking about themselves. That's right. Uh oh. Okay. Mr. L. L. Keller, who was a, one of the delegates to the National Convention. Right. And he, he was the first socialist, uh, and I didn't know anything about socialism. And Keller uh, was very good. He knew what he was talking about, although he was just a male hand. But he knew what he was talking about, and he was a socialist. He was a member of the Socialist Party. Uh, he told me, uh, and I asked him who, he, who, who was that guy. He told me about Norman Thomas. He said he was always quoting Norman Thomas. I don't know how accurate it was, but he he wanted to say something. He'd say, "Well, Norman Thomas said it, you know." And uh, yeah, I remember Keller well. Uh, he died not too long ago. He was quite a guy. Oh, and uh, let me tell you something else too. That uh, this is going back to what we were talking about. Uh, that during the strike, I said the churches were against us, uh, and they were. These, uh, just the general run of the churches around here, which are mostly um, Baptist to Presbyterian Methodist, but it was the, um, oh, the fundamentalists that were against us. But there was two church groups that never did fight us and helped us all the way through, and that was the Jewish church and the Catholics. Mm -hmm. they, they helped us. What did they do for you? Uh, John T. O'Connor, who was a... a whatever Catholics have, bishops or whatever they have. He was a, an officer in the Catholic Church, and he was also an old-time union man before he got into politics and uh, became mayor of Knoxville. He was a railroad worker, and he supported us. And Max Friedman, who is a, a Jewish leader here, he supported us all the way, even gave us money on the strike line. Did he come, really? Uh-huh, he sure did. Talk about that. Talk yeah. So. Uh, Max Friedman owned a jewelry store here. And uh, later he was also a city councilman uh, for s some time. And he was really a, a leader in a lot of things here in Knoxville. And he and, um, oh, there was a, oh, I can't think of his name right off, but his, um, uh, Jewish tailor uptown because we called him by his name the tra the uh, the tailor and when when we were trying to find a place to meet we met in this tailor's shop and Max Friedman arranged this for would us. Would you do it between the time now and the time we record with you? Could you see if you could find out the tales of that so you could give us a name and so forth? Yeah, I sure will. Because that's something I think we want to show. One of the things we want to show is that the South wasn't just all of that, that there were these Let's little see. pockets of, of, of support. Now, the sign, I, I can see the sign on his building now. Job, no, wasn't quite that. Job the tailor. No, that wasn't quite it. The tailor. And he let us meet. We, we'd want to meet downtown because that's where the people lived everywhere. I can't think of his name, but he had that the tailor. At uh, what point in the year of organizing was this happening? Was this in 1933? Or? Yes, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. When we were organizing and trying to find a place to meet. And uh, Max Friedman, he was, well, we all, the, the whole town thought when he died, it's one of the biggest funerals we'd ever had around here. How did you feel when the, the 
such an overwhelming vote against joining the national strike a week before it was going to be called? Oh, uh, uh, the people didn't want to strike? Yeah. Well, we, uh, there was, uh, the first thing was, we'll all lose our job, you know, and money was very hard to come by then. But we did get them all together and convinced them that the only way we're going to get better changes here is through the union. And that took some convincing, too. Because it was um, Back. Oh, absolutely. Did you ever know Franz Daniel? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Well, Franz helped us. He was yeah, here. He. Sure. Oh yeah. He was here in 32. Oh yeah. He. Well, he was here in 34. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. when. That's when the strike was. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Uh, Franz was here, and he he helped us a lot because see, right, right while we were on strike, while we were picketing there uh, down there, um, Heinzen the president of the mill there dropped dead. Yeah, and that that was, oh gee, you talk about a meeting when we had one that day. We had all of our members were going to quit and everything else. We had killed him, you know. Well, I mean, the pre it wasn't uh, the president of the union, the president of the mill. Right? president of the mill. Yeah. Did I say union? I meant no, mill. Yeah. And Franz came to our meeting. I asked him, I said, what am I going to do? These people think we killed him. And Franz made one of the best speeches to our meeting that day I have ever heard. And he said, now don't you people feel one bit guilty. What that old man's conscience did to him has nothing to do with you. And I thought, oh, thank you, Franz, for helping us out here, because that was one. You can imagine all these uh, fundamentalist uh, churchgoers here, and the man died. Oh, God, we killed him. You know, whew, that was what a rough one. Fred Reynolds? He was one who left here. He left out. He, he was uh, black history. Uh-huh. He was president, by the way, of the Brookside Union. Yeah. My brother worked at the Brookside. Is your brother alive? No. He died in 56. So I just outlived all these people. So Fred Reynolds moved. Do you know where he moved? I think he went to Gastonia with, because a whole bunch of them did go to Gastonia. What about Uh, Cecil died too. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah. Is that is that the one they call Foot Foots yeah. Weaver there? Yeah, yeah. Foots. Yeah. Yeah. Foot. He's gone. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, gotcha. Did uh, you mention tomorrow? Did you want to come back tomorrow? Yeah. Okay. Okay. We've well, got all of these other things. We're looking for names of people. You well, want to, here's a headline which we're trying to change. See. Gorman seeks troop protection. What would that be? Let's see. And there's no, and there's no mention of Gorman in that story. Well, wonder why they <laughs> judge in Jones know. Cherokee yeah, Street. Must be Gorman. A, been another story in the same thing. But did you ever have troops here? No, no, we we, uh, we didn't get those. Okay. What about the local police? Strangely enough. We didn't have any trouble with the police. I, I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I never have known why we didn't have. But we didn't have any trouble with the, the, with the police. Uh, they were very cautious. You know, uh, if any little scuffling was going on or anything like this, they didn't see it. But how did you feel when that injunction came out? Uh, I didn't know what to do about it. Uh, I didn't know how an injunction uh, was going to work, and I know it scared a lot of our people. I mean, you know? I've never seen an injunction quite so profound. Oh, I know it. I know it. That was a real injunction, and that set us back, too, hmm. because that scared people, it scared them very much. No, the injunction was the right, wasn't during the strike. It was... No, no, it was right in the middle. Right, right in the, in the, the middle. middle right in the middle. They, they stopped us from picketing. Yeah, and 13, um, September the 12th. Right, right, right. 
Could you tell, there was a meeting that you had to discuss the injunction, wasn't it, to explain to people what to do? Um, we, we held that meeting and it was poorly attended because a lot of people thought that if, you know, if they went to the meeting uh, that they would be uh, accused of violating the injunction. Now, did you have spies from the company in your outfit? Um, we thought we had one, and uh, we got rid of him. You talked about <laughs> that more specifically? <laughs> um, we thought he was a spy. He said later that he was not. Uh, but we thought he was because the company was getting some information. Uh, because one night, uh, somebody uh, scattered roofing nails in front of the mill there. And we thought that there was a certain guy there that had told on us, told on whoever did do it. We never could prove it, though, and the guy said he was, that he didn't, so. It's interesting. I think the, uh, I've thought about it later. I think the company at that time, I think all they knew was to be afraid. They, they were actually a little bit afraid of us. And I think that's because they didn't know anything about the labor movement either. Because I, I know, see, we, we were, uh, I never thought that strike uh, should have been called at that time. I think that that was very poor timing because at that time we had 600 employees at Cherokee and we had 600 members. We had everybody signed up. We were in the process of getting a contract signed. And I had learned from people like um, uh, Franz Daniel when we were talking about our contract. Franz Daniel and Miles Horton uh, both told me, because I was wondering what we were going to do if they didn't sign the contract. And Miles and uh, Franz both told me, said, well, go in there and do, negotiate the very best you can but whatever you do, you save your union. And that was, that was good advice. And uh, then, before we could negotiate the contract, the national strike was called. So, yes, again, I think it's important for us to say it was poorly timed. It was very poorly timed. Now, I noticed here, in these pictures, they're almost all men. Is that just a happenstance? That was just a happenstance because there's... Uh, See, I think I'm the only woman that's shown up there. No, there's okay. maybe one over there. You know, that's okay. That's uh... Fritz Weaver. <laughs> yeah, that that just happened because there's many women, more women, more women work there yeah. than men. I was wondering because and, and yeah, the women in the leadership and so forth. Now, I'm just looking for other names here. Oh, I'm I'm collecting a whole bunch. Yeah. Now, there's a telegram from the New Republic. What well, let's to? see, what, what, what was that about? Oh, I wrote a letter to the New Republic. I wonder what I said. Desire publish your Mando letter. Yeah, I wrote a letter to the New Republic and it was published, and I, I told them, go ahead and sign, yeah, sign my name. I was, at that point then, I didn't care any. Then, you, now, here's another thing. I uh, see you, uh, you wrote to Mighty Perkins, uh, the interview for uh, uh, Now, in the documents here, in addition to writing to Johnson and Roosevelt, you wrote, or uh, members of your, uh, your president of your local wrote, to Donald Richburg and who else? The number of New Deal leaders. Um, well, Lucille wrote to Samuel and McClord. Yes, okay. Who was the executive assistant mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the Textiles Relations yeah. Board. That would be conventional, but who else did she write? Um, Roxy Clark wrote to Mr. Lewis Mick 
Mikhail, secretary to the president, mm -hmm. which was not, that didn't happen mm -hmm. all the time. Mm -hmm. Roxy Clark also wrote to Mr. Richburg. Donald Richburg. Yes, yes, I, I typed Nubial. all of Roxy's letters. New, New <laughs> you did? Yeah. yeah. That's what I Fanny Connor wrote to, what did she, she wrote to Francis Biddle. Francis Biddle was another New Deal man. Yeah, uh, yeah. Biddle. What gave you the idea to write to all of these New Deal leaders who were not necessarily in the kind of general line? Uh, we were uh, trying to publicize what was going on here. We'd see a name in the paper, we'd write him a letter. I see. Okay. <laughs> and they were all written by women. You see, this... Yeah. We, we got uh, somewhere there's answers to all those. Yeah, but you see, what, what I'm trying to fix is that there seemed to be a kind of intellectual ferment here that we haven't found anywhere else. Oh, is that right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, writing, to, they're writing to Johnson, they're writing back in person, but they don't seem to be having the kind of savvy that you people had, and I'm trying to find out where it came <laughs> where from. Where it came from. <laughs> well, one thing, uh, this uh, uh, Preacher Camel, who was our first president at the local there, he told him how important it was to write letters. And he had a lot of them writing letters oh, to the editor here. Okay. Uh huh. He had them writing letters to the editor. And as I said, they'd see a name in the paper. Uh, some of these people that they're writing to there really didn't have anything to do with, well, <laughs> with the union at all. Uh, right. And they say, well, we'll write him a letter too. Now, you know. Preacher Campbell. Tell us Campbell about that. Campbell or Campbell? C A M P B E L L. Now, he was elected president of the local... Of our local union here. When was he elected president? Uh, we started organizing that union in um, September of 33. And see, we'd only been organized uh, until May of the next year. No time for any education no. or anything in there. And... Uh, uh, we all decided, I don't know, we, we elected him right off because he was a talker and he was a preacher. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he, he, he was good. And yeah, he I, was this is a good corrective to this just blanket business that the religion was all against it. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Now, did you, a lot, did, did you all write these letters together? Uh, some of them we did. Uh, some of them would write them out. If you'll notice, a lot of them are on the same typewriter. I typed a lot of them. They would write the letter, and I'd type it. We thought we had to send a typed letter to them, which we didn't have to. And then there was a lot of handwritten uh, letters, too, because the preacher would tell us, you know, well, write him a letter. And like I said, they'd see a name in the paper, you know, if it was the head of the agricultural department or anybody, they'd write him a letter. Now, your outfit seems to have been more literate than most of the locals that we've been finding. Oh, is that right? Yeah. Well, we didn't know that at the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Does it have anything yeah. to do with being in a city? No, I wouldn't think so. How Would many you? of your, of, your uh, of the women in your mill were high school graduates? Not... High school, or high school even going to high school? Not one that that I knew of. Uh, but we did have, uh, after they s began to learn something about the labor movement, just like I was, uh, they, they would pick up on things, you know, like, for instance, this letter writing. Uh, they, had, they had that much, uh, I guess you'd say, intelligence more than education. Now, the, the fact that she typed these letters mean that that's why the language is more conventional than the pitiful letters we've been getting from some I, I guess so, because I typed their letters. You see, because we've been getting a lot of letters, very s touching letters, uh -huh. but in, in very poor English, and, uh, and yours are not that at all. Well, uh, for one thing, at that time, including me, we thought they'd read a typed letter, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. that that was the way to do it. Mm -hmm. okay. But and, also, uh, also the phrasing and everything else uh -huh. is, is, quite, uh, uh -huh. is quite 
the sophisticated is not the right <laughs> word, but. Shall we go over some names? Sure, yes. Okay. Um, first letter I have, okay. Lucille Thornburg, thank God Good. she's here. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Thank you, and thank you for being strong enough to only have shingles. I'm sorry you've got it. All right. right. Um, Roxy Clark, where is she? Oh, uh, Roxy died. Roxy had cancer and she died. And she was good. She's a great big heavy set woman. Always spoke out in the meetings. And Roxy was one of our Do you have any pictures of Roxy? I don't I doubt it. But we could look hard. I, I don't think that I have one of Roxy. Does Roxy have any children in town? Not that I know of. Because okay. Uh, she was an old woman when I knew her. Okay. Uh, see, want, where, uh, no, I just wanted to see oh, where she lived. What What's 35? her address? What's her address? Um, 2448 Vandeventer. Vandeventer, that's Marble City. Was you she know. married? Yeah, and her husband died immediately after the strike. I remember Roxy well. She was a big old fat woman. She was always wanting to write letters. Did she have a son? I don't think so. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Okay. No, I don't. I don't. I don't know of a single person that okay, was well, in that. Okay, we'll we'll just go over them okay. systematically. Okay. Okay. And we'll read these letters together after. And then Fanny Connor. She lived in Bearden, Tennessee. She wrote to mm -hmm. Max A. Egloff. What did she write to him for? <laughs> I don't know, but she did. That's. No, I'm wrong. No, Fanny Connor. Where is Fanny's letter? Yep, here's Fanny's letter. Okay. Uh, here's Fanny's letter. Yep, she wrote to Judge Stacy. That's who she wrote to. Judge Stacy. Dear Mr. Stacy. Judge who, Walter Stacy. Who was uh, had to enforce the uh, injunction, probably. She had, being one of the locked out employees of the Cherokee Spinning Company in Knox. She wrote that letter herself. I don't know what ever happened to her. I never heard. When was the last Mountain time you saw Fanny Oh, Lord. Uh, see, after, um, after the strike, I went to work for TVA. And in 1939, I was transferred to Wilson Dam. So I was away from here. And then from Wilson Dam, I went to Washington, D.C. And then from there, back to traveling for the labor movement. So I lost out on, you know, if those people had been living, I wouldn't have. She wrote her own letter, so. Okay. What about Inez deputy? Uh, Inez got killed. Uh, uh huh. And Inez was one of our good ones too. What happened? Uh, in an automobile accident. Uh. Do you have a picture of Inez? No, I don't think I have a picture of any of those people. We should have had pictures taken of our group that time, but we didn't think about that. Do you think the newspaper took pictures of people? I doubt it of individuals like that. Yeah. Okay, did she, she was a miss here. Did she ever get married or anything like that? Not that I know of. And there's, is that a she handwritten one? She wrote it by one? handwritten, yeah. Uh-huh. Well, she wrote her own letters. Addie right? Hurt, Mrs. Addie Hurt. Don't remember Addie. Addie, Addie, Addie. Who Addie? Where'd she live? Uh, she hmm. lived at 2606 Division Street. That's Marble City, too. Marble City. Okay, so I could try and look into her, right? Yeah, I don't know what. Don't discourage me now. No, I won't. I won't. Roxy this woman is, uh, has come up with so many. Roxy Clark, Roxy Clark wrote another letter. Okay, now, get this, okay? I have a lot of names here. It might be more easy for you. All right, let but me look I refuse those. to believe that all these people are dead. Well, they're so, probably not. Okay. But remember now, I was one of the younger ones. Fanny Jim Bennett, Fanny Connor, Lucy O'Connor. That uh, Catherine uh, Coop there. Yes. Uh, her husband. Uh, there, I, I, I know he's dead, and I don't know whether she is or not. But they were both very good. He was a good organizer. And the cups and rocks. Where'd you get this list? That's Washington, oh, D.C. Good. And here's one over here, this uh, J.H. Uh, lining back. He was an awfully good union member. Jim Clayton, Bessie Davis, Hazel Dockery. 
I, I don't know a single one of these that's still living. Um, this guy, E.R. McGinley. Yeah. I met his wife about six months ago, but she has Alzheimer's. She said he died just about three years ago. I was wondering if J.H. Monroe was... J.H. Monroe. I just wonder if he's still... Didn't he go to the convention? We don't have his name. Uh, he... Uh, he was very active in the union. You met, you read very, him. very active. Jimmy Monroe. He was. He was a big deal, wasn't he? Yeah. Um, he. Listen, uh, wait. We have it, it. It's written in here that at one of the meetings that you had when the when the delegates came back from the convention and they explained why they wanted to go, why they voted to go on strike. And everybody decided, no, we don't want to go on strike. Uh, yeah. And they decided to take a uh, and have an election at that point. Wasn't he one of the presenters? Yes, he was. He sure was. So Jim, he was the one who went to Jimmy the Jimmy Monroe. You think he's alive? No, oh. no. I know he is not because I kept up with him. I knew him. Okay. And this is Zola Obal. She died not long ago. Thelma Monroe was Jimmy Monroe's wife. Oh, a lot of these I'd forgotten all about, but I don't. I don't. I, I sure don't. I don't know a one of these Here's that right, are. Here's another uh, page. That, Here's another page. Ralph Goodwin was a. He was an awfully good union member too. Was. Robert Thompson died in a nursing home about two years ago. I guess we see, we see you and you're just in such great health and you look so wonderful and you're so vibrant when you think everybody's like you. <laughs> yeah, I don't know why all these people wanted to die, do you? So was J James Monroe was one of those that did go to that convention? Oh, I said a while ago that that uh, uh, Heinsen was the president that died. It was not. It was Mebane, M-E-B-A-N-E, Mebane. It was, it was uh, Heinsen is the, his son is the president of Cherokee now. So this, the one that died was Mebane, H.B. Mebane. I think I've got it. Okay, I hope you have, because uh, that would be H. wrong. H.B. Medvin, that's right. H. Yeah, H. He's, he's the Jerky one. Jerky Mills dies of a heart attack. That's right, then. that's right. And I, I think I Man called him, uh, yeah. I think I said Hanson a while ago, because yeah. Hanson is the people no. that runs it now. Yeah. Um, do you realize, you know who, who wrote this? It was written by the Cherokee Spinning Company. This was their document. Who signed it? Mm. E. J. McMillan, one of the richest men in Knoxville, he died not terribly long ago, and um, he was also on the Standard Knitting Mill. We didn't know that at the time. Very wealthy, extremely wealthy. So they put this list together. They wrote a narrative of what they said happened during that whole period of time, and then... Uh, why are they blacklisted people? Oh, is that right? And these are all the people that were blacklisted. They admit it. I mean, they, they proclaim it. Mm-hmm. They didn't care for blacklisting us. Yeah. So that we've got the documents, you see. And we're just trying to find some of the people. And we, but, uh, somehow we've been in a number of places we've been able to find people. You have been able to find oh, yes. Good. We've been able to find particularly families that were evicted. And we were able to say, well, you were evicted. Here's your name. So then they, they, they're, they're willing to come out. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. um, what about that other mill, Brookside Mill? Um, 
Do you think that we'd be able to find, I, if I got documentation on Brookside Mill, I, do you know people offhand from there? Not right off. My brother at one time worked at the Brookside. I was trying to think who the business agent was over there. I can't, I can't think of any of those. I never worked at Brookside, so I didn't know any of the people in there. But, uh, you know, the, the, the males had their class, too. Cherokee was supposed to be more of a high-class mill in Brookside. Huh. Why was that? Well, they said people couldn't get a job anywhere else, went to the Brookside, you know, and get fired from one. And, you know, before the union, uh, I was... Uh, I was fired from the, I worked at the Appalachian Mail for a while, of course, all this before the union day. I worked at the Appalachian for a while. They hired, they fired me. A week later, they hired me back. They didn't care. I mean, they didn't, uh, you know, you gave no references or anything. All they wanted was your name, your name and address. That's all you had to give them, you know. Uh -huh. That's all. That's all. They didn't, they didn't care anything about any of the rest of it. So, uh, People would go in there. Always said the people who couldn't work anywhere else went to the Brookside. Well, it's interesting that uh, Eula was saying that she worked at a hobo mill. Oh, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Um. Is this the letter that you wrote? I think it is. Um. No, uh, Elizabeth Rutherford. Do you remember her? I don't remember her at all. She wrote in 1935. Why don't you read yeah, it? Yeah, let's see that. You can read it out loud, even. Was she writing to the president of the United States? Can you read, can you read if, it? Uh-huh, if I hadn't got sick and had to come home. Can you read it out loud, Lucille? Mr. Charlie Bell put me on the state. I wonder what she means here, put me on the state relief. When I wasn't able to work, I had no one to depend on. Lord, she wrote him a long letter, didn't she? Whoops. She send this to Roosevelt, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> Look what she says here. This is interesting. Then they called a strike at Cherokee Spinning Company, saying that you called for the strike instead of Francis Gorman. Interesting. You never did finish your beer, girl. <laughs> Yours. I'm not good that way. Do you need another one? No, no, thank you. What time do you have to get up in the morning? You know, oh, I get up about 6.30. Six we do, George. I told him we'd be there after 10. Okay, right. Where'd you go? Days in East, like you said. Yeah. You know how to get there? No. Very simple. Well, only afterwards. Oh, we didn't need him before the strike. It was what only was his in name? To I'm the trying to, I can't think of his name. Um, I remember he, he and uh, his wife worked in the office with him, and we had to have some papers notarized, and she did it. I'll think in a minute. What was his name? Now, what about all the the minutes to your meetings and? All that kind of documentation. I mean, you met for a whole year. What happened to all that stuff? I don't know. I, I really don't know what happened to all of it. But we did have, of course, we had the minutes read every meeting. Now, where did you get the training to hold those meetings? I didn't have any. I, 
I, I, I didn't have anybody, any anything. But uh, uh, Miles Horton gave me Robert's Rules of Order. Uh -huh. And you had that, this is, he gave it to you, what, at 33? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, 34, when we 34. were, uh, no. I think he went to one of our meetings and saw how poorly it was handled. And he gave me Robert's Rules of Order and told me to read it, and I did. That's good. Uh-huh, so... <laughs> What, what happened to your, do, do you feel like something really changed for you personally once you started to become active in the union? Yeah, I guess I did because um, I, I had the feeling when we were working those long hours that something should be done, that there's something that wasn't right. But I didn't know what it was. And then when I did learn about the union, I thought that's the answer. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I knew there was something that that uh, was missing, and I knew that the church were not, was not providing it. Uh -huh. You know, so many people were dependent on the church. On the church. Absolutely, yeah. and I could see that the church was not providing it. Well, now one of the things that must. Yeah, pretty girl. The, the young girl. <laughs> the pictures in the in the Philadelphia papers and so forth and so on. The other women must have resented that like hell. Um they were not exactly. Uh, they in a way they appreciated me for doing something that they didn't have guts enough to do. You know, and they got to thinking about me more of a leader than I wanted them to think. I wanted them, you know, to take part too. Uh, but they didn't. They'd say, you know, giving me the responsibility of running the whole thing instead of that. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting, yeah. What about, um, I'm just wondering about your self-esteem. I mean, did you feel like yourself, did, did your feelings about yourself personally change? Once you started to do all this work? Um, yeah, I guess it did. Um, because before I had learned anything about the union at all, I had this feeling that something ought to be done, but I don't know what to do. And, you know, wh wh why, why, don't, why don't I do it? And as I said, I knew that there was an answer somewhere, but I didn't know where. It wasn't in the church. It wasn't in the schools. It wasn't anywhere. And so I, I, maybe I did get to feeling better about myself that, you know, I'm doing something wrong or right. I'm doing something. Now, Eula obviously got a lot of support from her, her association with the Women's Trade Union League. Yes, she did. And all uh -huh. of that. Did you have no, anything like no, that? No, no. No, I sure didn't. Oh, you know, when we were... Um, uh, on the uh, picket line and doing things like that and even up until just a few years ago uh, uh, men would still think well why aren't you at home you know doing whatever you do at home you know instead of out here doing this and uh, I think that's one thing that the labor movement really did do is because when I first started going to the Central Labor Council here in Knoxville now. This was in 19, well, late 1933. There was, I took two women with me from the textile workers. So there was three women over there. And they tried to organize uh, an auxiliary over there. Well, they thought that the, we three women could help to get that. Some sharp guy thought, you know, well, they ought to have an auxiliary. Lord, we couldn't organize an auxiliary. Those men said the labor temple is no place for a woman. That's the truth. That's the way they felt about it, you know. And I don't know that that has changed all that much yet. Because in our Central Labor Council here, and the Central Labor Council here was organized in 1889 with the carpenters and railroad workers. That's all they had. And they had them over there. And to this day, 
they have not had a woman president over there. Now, when I was given that scholarship to England, and went over there and studied for 18 months, and I came back, you know, I was all full of vinegar and everything, and I wanted to do things and this, that, and the other. And I thought, well, uh, this is 1948. I thought, well, maybe I'll run for president of Central Labor Council. There's so many things I wanted to do. People looked at me like I was crazy. You don't have a woman. A woman can be secretary, but she can't be president. And they haven't had a woman president yet. And on that AF of LCIO executive board, how many women they have? What have they got, two? And they've got some good women in the labor movement, in the ILGW and the uh, um, uh, Amalgamated and these different unions. They don't have them yet. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid that's true. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I noticed when I went to the uh, Act 2 convention last year, who was up on the drostrum? Almost all middle class, middle aged men. Right. Who was in the floor? More than half women. Right. That Very is clear. exactly right. Very clear. It, it certainly was, yeah, and that has that has not I changed. I just wondered how long that's going to be tolerated. I do too. Yeah. I do too. Uh, we've never had a, and I was. Uh, I was the first woman delegate to the Tennessee Federation of Labor. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't have any at all. Mm -hmm. That was unheard of. Now, I remember I was in here and I just happened to with some research work I was doing. I was working on a study of the Negro in America with Brianna Mirdal and all this in 1940 and so on. And I came through this area. And I remember at that time, and this was in 39-40, you had a very strong teacher's union here. Mm -hmm. There was a young fellow who was ahead of us, I forget his name. But I remember being very impressed with having a feeling that Knoxville was a real kind of labor town. Mm -hmm. It was. Yeah. And we were, uh, you know, the Ta when did the Taft-Hartley law come in? That I know that threw a damper on yeah. a lot of on a lot of things, but. Miss uh, Neal, when did you become president of your union? Uh, Preacher Camel was the first president. I think it was just before the strike that I, I became president. I'm pretty sure it was, and the strike started in May of 34. September. September, I'm sorry. Well, the strike in, yeah, September. Yeah. So, uh, right after the I, th I think I became president then. I wish we had the old minutes from then. Well, actually, we might be able to put it together some in the... Do you, now, this is to jump, but you did a wonderful story about Labor Day in 1936, and then that fellow wrote it. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. You mentioned that there was some film taken. Do you have any idea why we were uh, that film? We, t uh, TVA, took that film. Mm -hmm. And Claire Killen's granddaughter was down here, and she went up to TVA to try to find that film. And she couldn't find it for some reason. I, I don't know what happened to it over those years. But they sure did. They took a film. You know, on TV had, uh huh. TV had, TV they have an archive had, uh, or something. I don't know. I'm sure TV had documents. And uh, she. You haven't seen it since. No, I haven't. Labor uh -huh. on Parade. Uh huh. Did yeah. they show it in the movie theater here when they said they would? No, no, they never showed it. But that was some parade. Mm -hmm. Must have been. See, we had the aluminum workers over yeah. at uh, Maryville, Tennessee, which is 16 yeah. miles from here. And we dragged the parade out there. Did you have a big parade in 1934? No, no. Uh, I don't. I don't think we even had a parade. Mm -hmm. I think this 1936 one. Was, was Did you on have support from these other unions during the strike in 34, like the what, aluminum workers? What few uh, unions were around were pretty supportive.
Mm -hmm. But there was such few, see, they hadn't started all this big organizing drive yet. We didn't have, uh, we, ha we had amalgamated, because they had Leibowitz Shirt Factory, they little shirt factory up there. That's where my sister worked. And I don't know whether Eula, no, Eula came in as an organizer, I guess, but my sister worked at the Leibowitz Shirt Factory. Is that a picture of you and your sister in the front hall when I walk in? No, that's the picture of my two oldest sisters. Do you have pictures other than what we see in the news in these in the scrapbook? Are there pictures of you? Probably somewhere. Yeah. Okay. We gotta go. Okay, tell me. Miles Horton came to Knoxville uh, during our strike. That was when I first met. He. Uh, this was 1934. But I think Highlander started down at Mont Eagle in 1932. So Miles came up here. And he wanted some of us to come down to Highlander, down to Mont Eagle, to a workshop uh, down there, you know. So we got a couple of these, I got a couple of men from around here and two women. We all went down to Highlander for the workshop. And when we came back, uh, somebody asked one of these men here, said, uh, I hear that they got niggers and whites down there all mixing up together. And said, I hear that.